Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Jesse Hitt, the Humane Education and Community Engagement Manager for the Humane Society of Huron Valley. She is our Learn and Grow speaker today. Um, Jesse was planning to pursue a master's degree in history in library science when she happened to attend an information session on the newly formed Humane Education Department at HSHV, Humane Society. During that info session, she learned about the existence of a master's program in humane education from the Institute of Humane Education. She knew right away that's what she wanted to do. Jesse enjoys talking to people of all ages about the interconnectedness of animal welfare, humanitarianism, and environmental protection. She has a special place in her heart for farmed animals and black cats. So please <laughs> welcome Jesse Hitt. Thank you, everybody. Um, I am very excited to be here, and I do like talking to people of all ages <laughs> about those things. Though I will say that I primarily speak with young people, so um, so kids. So this is um, a lot more formal than I'm used to. So I apologize if I'm um, if I can keep it sort of casual. Um, but yes, I've worked at the Humane Society of Huron Valley for about ten years now. Um, and I'm going to start by just doing a, a sort of a little information about our facility in, in case you are unfamiliar, um, and then we'll get into um, options for having um, pets as, um, as a senior or a retiree. So first, um, if you have not, oh, sorry, I'm trying to up this okay, um, I guess just out of curiosity, how many of you have been to our facility at the Humane Society of Huron Valley? Or tiny lions. Some of you I know maybe have experience at tiny lions. Um, if you haven't been there in recent years, um, we built a new facility in 2009, which I guess was a while ago now. But um, if you only ever saw the old facility, I highly recommend taking a trip out because we're we're really kind of a state of the art facility. Um, we've won multiple um, recognitions for being um, the largest. Um, the largest shelter in Michigan with the highest save rate, um, and it's, it's a pretty impressive facility. Uh, we are an animal welfare organization, primarily, you know, we're taking care of companion animals, but we really do see ourselves as um, sort of interested in the welfare of all animals living within the community. Um, that, that means different things depending on, uh, you know, the species, but uh, we do consider all animals important. Uh, we are a nonprofit, 5013C, um, and we function primarily based off of donations. So um, we do have a contract with Washtenaw County as the stray holding facility. Um, so we get a little bit of our funding that way, but the rest is donations. Um, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, also, one other thing that I, I did not know until I worked at the Humane Society um, is that we actually are not affiliated or connected with other humane societies, either in the state or across the country. Um, so we're not connected with Michigan Humane Society or the Humane Society of the United States. We, um, we're all sort of independent entities. We just use the term humane society because it's, it's recognizable. People know what a humane society is. Um, but yeah, we don't share funding or resources or anything like that with any other facilities. Okay, so our, um, this is just a sort of small look at um, our, our facility from the outside. Um, we're usually quite busy, we have a lot going on. Um, our mission is to support the loving, responsible care of all animals in our community, primarily through adoptions. Uh, we, like I said, we do take care of all of the sick, homeless, stray um, animals in Washtenaw County. Um, and but we do also have a full-scale veterinary clinic, an outpatient clinic that is for anyone. It doesn't just have to be um, if you've gotten your your pet from us. Uh, and another thing that makes us a little bit unique in the humane society world is that we have a cruelty investigation and a wildlife rescue team. So if you were um, 
to potentially suspect animal cruelty or abuse or neglect taking place somewhere, you could call us and we will um, go look into it and potentially prosecute if, if it's warranted. Um, and then if you were to ever find a sick or injured wild animal, we have a 24-7 service. You can call us if you are in Washtenaw County um, and we will come respond and help the animal in any way that we can. Um, we also have a lot of people-focused support. So we are doing things like uh, we have a Bountiful Bulls program. This helps people who have maybe temporarily fallen on hard times. They don't want to give up their animal, but they're having trouble feeding them. Um, and we will supplement um, their pet food. Um, we have low-cost vaccine clinics, low-cost spay and neuter clinics. Um, and then most of what I do is humane education and advocacy. So talking to people about the Humane Society, what we do, and um, just letting people know the, the resources that we have available. Um, I think I sort of glossed over it, but we do service all of Washtenaw County. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, the focus is Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti since that's where we're closest to. Um, but we, you know, we service all of uh, Manchester, Chelsea, Dexter as well. All right, so let's talk about um, pets. <laughs> um, you know, I, I can't necessarily tell you if a pet is the right choice for you or not, but we can definitely talk about some options. So, okay, so there are certainly benefits to having a pet or an animal companion. Um, reducing feelings of isolation and loneliness. Uh, this is certainly something we saw, we always knew, but certainly saw an uptick in during pandemic times, right? A lot of people were cooped up, they were alone, um, they didn't maybe have connection with other people, so being able to have a pet in the home certainly helped alleviate some of those things. Um, having a pet can provide a lot of people a sense of purpose, um, you know, there's someone they have to look after. Uh, they help maintain physical activity. Um, I can tell you, I don't know that he'd enjoy me sharing, but my, my father recently had a, uh, a hip replacement and part of his recovery is he's supposed to go for a little walk every day, so he, he takes the dog and um, keeps, him, keeps him on his, on his toes. <laughs> um, and it can just help provide a routine. A routine can be a very comforting thing for folks, especially you know if you were used to working and uh, doing sort of certain work every day. It can help provide that for you. Um, and it can help make a connection with other people. So again, back to my, my dad who is retired and at home with the dog. He, um, you know, he walks around the sort of um, neighborhood with, uh, with the dog and he gets to meet neighbors that way because everyone, he's a golden doodle, he's adorable. So everyone wants, <laughs> everyone wants to meet him. So, um, and then my dad gets to form connections with the neighbors as well. Okay, so um, University of Michigan actually has um, a lot of resources on, <laughs> um, on aging and um, they did a whole study on the benefits of pets. Uh, maybe you're all familiar with this already, but um, they did a national poll on aging um, in 2019 and what they found was that um, pet owners reported 79% um, said that they had reduced stress um, having an animal at home. 73% uh, said that having a pet provided a sense of purpose for them. 65% uh, said that they formed a connection with others, and 64% said it helped them stay physically <coughs> active. So again, those are pretty good numbers um, to show some of the helpfulness of having an animal at home. There are sometimes potential challenges, though, or things to think about, um, you know, there are a lot of pluses to having an animal companion at home, but there are some other, maybe again, challenges. So tripping hazards. We do sometimes get, um, or just under underfoot, right? We have, um, we do get animals surrendered to us sometimes from people who just, you know, maybe they got a puppy or they got just a rambunctious younger dog and uh, they didn't realize quite maybe <laughs> the mobility <laughs> um, problems that that might cause. Um, and even, even with cats, they, I don't know about mine, are always under my feet. So, um, so yeah, that's something to consider. Um, it can cause some limitations on travel as well. So um, 
I, I don't know, but I'm assuming a lot of folks probably like to spend retirement traveling. And if you have animals at home, you're going to have to find, they're either going to have to go with you. Um, so you're going to have to find um, travel, or like hotels, et cetera, where you can bring your animals. Um, or you're going to have to find some place to board them or someone to watch them, right? Or at least check in on them. So, um, and that can be limiting. It can also be expensive. Uh, which leads me to the next one, which is financial strain. So um, animals can be expensive. <laughs> uh, we probably are already aware of that, but um, but yeah, vet visits, uh, just basic things. Um, and then we did hear, um, this is again, a lot of this is from that U of M poll, but a lot of um, people found that they were prioritizing their own animal over themselves. So if there was a financial constraint, maybe getting their animal's medication before getting their own medication. Um, and while that's very noble and nice for your animal, maybe not the best choice for, for you. Okay, so I did um, include this video. I'm gonna see if I can get it to play. Um, this is from some folks that worked at U of M and they actually recorded this at our facility. So I thought it would be a good, if, if it works. <laughs> if not, we'll move on. But any luck? No? That's all right. Oh, yeah, sometimes it just won't work. Okay, it's a link. So if, I don't know if we're connected to the internet or not, but um, no, we're not. okay, well that'll explain it. <laughs> um, no worries. Um, if you are interested in looking this up, all you have to do is search um, U of M uh, poll on aging, and this is fairly easily accessible. So okay, so what are your options um, if you you know do maybe want an animal in your life? Um, Adoption, obviously, or of course you can buy an animal, but as a humane society, we're going to recommend adoption first. Um, you can foster if um, maybe adoption is too much of a commitment, um, or if all of that's a commitment, you can always volunteer. We are always looking for volunteers, and we have a wide variety of options um, for volunteering. So I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. Okay, so adoption. Um, Adoption is great. We would love to have more people adopt. We're, we're relatively full right now, but there are definite considerations. And honestly, these are not just for seniors. These are just sort of across the board <laughs> considerations people should make before adopting. Um, but the first one I'm going to say is activity level. It's really going to be a good idea to match sort of your energy level, your activity level with your pets. Um, you know, there might be uh, the idea that, okay, I'll get a really active dog, and then that'll make me active, um, which might work, um, but I have to tell you, sometimes those, those animals, they're surprising with their limitless energy. So try to find a good match that way. Um, puppies and kittens tend to have more energy, be a little bit more time consuming than um, perhaps an older animal. Uh, the nice thing too about getting, um, and I love puppies and kittens, but I'm, I'm a sucker for a slightly older animal because you really are going to be able to know their personality a little bit more um, and their, their energy level. Um, also, all animals are different, but I would say cats do tend to have lower exercise needs than, than dogs. So, you know, you're, you're likely not going to have to take a cat, you know, on a long hike or anything. Um, but then again, um, then again, I don't know, I have, I have some pretty spunky cats at home myself. Uh, the, another thing to consider is your living situation. So um, one thing is, if you, if you are a renter, you do um, need to make sure there aren't any pet restrictions where you're at, or if you... Um, you know, have an HOA, if you have a condo association, any of those double check before you get the animal, what's allowed there. Um, if you are going to get a dog, I very much recommend um, thinking again about what's reasonable for you. Do you have a yard or an outdoor space where you can just sort of let the dog out to get exercise or are you going to have to take them out for a walk every time? Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but I guess think um, think ahead to whether that's something you're going to want to do, especially like today, not a problem. In the middle of the winter, not so much. Um, and then another thing to consider is, do you plan to stay in that living situation? Um, you know, obviously, 
you might not have everything planned out far in advance, but it is good to know um, ahead of time. You know, we, we will get people sometimes who I think, again, are well-intentioned, but they'll adopt an animal and then, you know, they'll realize, oh, I actually don't, I have to move into an assisted living or I have to um, move in with a relative and then they can't take the animal with them. So try to think about that ahead of time. Obviously, unexpected things do occur, but try to plan on that. We do fortunately know, and um, I don't know if some of our sponsors here today have more information, but there are several assisted living or um, just uh, communities that do allow animals, so that's great, but unfortunately there are some that do not. All right, costs. We estimate cost for a dog for a year to average about $1,500. And honestly, I, I think that's being a little generous, to be honest, but, um, and a cat about a thousand per year. So, um, and that's, I think, just sort of covering the, the, the basics. So something to consider is, again, the cost. And I think sometimes when people um, get animals, um, they don't think about all of the things they need. So yes, food, et cetera, but that bills, they're not cheap. Um, uh, general supplies, toys, grooming, if that's a requirement, and then again, pet sitters or uh, boarding facilities, all of that, um, or dog walkers. Uh, training is something that you have to um, keep in mind, again, especially if you're getting a younger animal or a younger dog. Um, their time, their money, and they take your energy, quite frankly. It's not just work for <laughs> the animal, it's work for the person as well. Um, classes at HSHV, which we offer a few, um, we offer a basic manners, a reactive rover, and a couple other options. And our classes range from about 200 to 250, depending on, on the class. Okay. Oh, I missed a page, sorry. Um, the long-term care, I knew I was getting ahead of myself. So um, something to think about, again, especially if you are um, a senior is considered the pet's lifespan. Um, and we do, I'm mostly, I've been mostly tailoring it to cats and dogs, but we do get other types of animals too. So we get birds, we get turtles, um, we have birds and turtles right now. <laughs> um, so if that's of interest, consider their lifespan. Um, you know, dogs are really going to vary, but they're probably going to live anyway, anywhere from 12 to 16 years. Cats can live up to be up to 20. Um, so think about if that um, feels you know, if you're getting a puppy or a kitten, you know, are, maybe that seems uh, feasible right now, but in, will it be long-term <laughs> feasible when you, you know, have a, I have a cat who's 10 at home and I thought he would be slowing down by now, but he is not. So just something to consider. Um, and then we're gonna recommend that you make a plan for your pet in case you aren't able to take care of them anymore. You know, you do have to go into um, a different living situation or um, again, you're maybe physically just not able to care for them. And that will lead me to my next slide. There we go. Okay, so long-term considerations. We recommend designating sort of an emergency pet caretaker. So, um, Someone who, yeah, it's basically like, uh, you know, if you had a kid in, in school and they had an emergency contact, have the same for your pet, right? Who could we contact who, who at least knows the animal and knows some basics? Um, I also recommend um, these little in case of emergency. <laughs> um, uh, they're like stickers or like clings that you can put in your windows. They're helpful in case of, you know, disaster at the home, but they also, you know, this morbid thought, but we do occasionally get animals in um, where they were in homes where the, the, their caretaker passed away and um, maybe no one knew to check about animals in there. So um, to have a sign is helpful. Um, you can include your pet in your will, or I heard, um, I, when I was looking this up, I saw several places actually recommended setting up a trust. Um, I, I do not know the details of that, but it, um, a lot of people were recommending that. And then we have um, at HSHV a program called Guardian Circle. And Guardian Circle um, is basically for anyone who has included HSHV in their estate planning. So um, the, I have some brochures that I will put out later in case you're interested, but um, the woman who runs this program told me that there's no 
minimum you have to contribute. So even if you just include a little and uh, for HSHV in your estate planning, you any pets you have at home are automatically included in the guardian circle, which offers con continuing care. So if you do predecease your animal, um, what we're going to do is we have sort of special um, special steps in place for them. So instead of just going through our sort of regular adoption process and having to be at the shelter for a while, um, we have sort of people who are in place to help take care of these animals. So again, I have some brochures about that that I'll put out um, later, but um, it's, it's a really great program because it can give you peace of mind. Um, and it's also, any of the finances are going towards helping animals that are currently in our, in our care. So um, it's, it's a win-win. All right, so I did want to talk a little bit about some of the resources that we offer at HSHV, um, specific to, to seniors. We do offer a senior discount. That's just across the board on veterinary services, adoption, um, our, our store with food and whatnot. Um, it's 10%, um, so you know, nothing to blow your socks off, but it's something. We do also offer a free senior to senior adoption. So um, that for the qualifications for that, if for any person that's 62 or older, you may adopt a dog that's eight or older or a cat that's 12 or older um, free. Uh, so um, obviously that doesn't remember to think about the financial <laughs> implications long term, but at the very least um, it, we, it, it really works out really nicely because sometimes you know these an the older animals stay in the shelter a little longer because people are nervous about taking an older animal. Um, they tend to be lower energy. So it can be a really good, good match. Um, we also do offer, um, if getting to the vet is difficult for folks, uh, we offer veterinary house calls. That is available to anyone in Washtenaw County or within 20 miles of HSHV. So, um, and uh, it's, it's really, it, I mean, everyone uses it. It doesn't matter if, um, again, you're, you're a senior or not. Sometimes the animals just prefer it, but it's a really cool program. We do also, we, are, we have partnered with several local Meals on Wheels. Um, so earlier I was mentioning our Bountiful Bowls program where we have food assistance for folks. So maybe we have people who um, you know, are, are homebound or just have difficulty getting out to get the pet food. Um, we have partnered with people who are already part of like the Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels. So in addition to their people food, we will also bring some pet food. Um, so that's a really cool thing. And then the last thing is um, FFL stands for Friends for Life. And um, I will talk about this, but I, this is a pretty new program. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, we just recently were awarded a grant from the Burr Family Foundation. And the grant um, specifically is helping us um, set up assistance uh, programs for seniors or, or people experiencing some sort of financial difficulties, medical difficulties. Um, keeping their pets. We, you know, we have a lot of people, uh, but we have people surrendering their animals because maybe they're, um, they have medical concerns or they have financial concerns um, and they don't really want to, but that's just what the only option they see. We're trying to help pets stay in their homes if, if it's reasonable for them to do so um, by providing these program. So I do have some information, but it, it's still pretty new. So, um, but we're doing things like offering low cost veterinary assistance and like I said, going to people's homes rather than um, having them come to us, um, providing some essential supplies. We're also able to offer some short term housing. So in general, we're not a boarding facility, but if someone maybe has a hospital stay and they just don't have anyone who can hair, uh, care for their animal, um, we can take care of their animal temporarily and then return them when they're, um, when they're home and recovered. We're trying to offer some more behavior help. So um, people who maybe are, they love their animal, but they're struggling with some sort of behavior concern. Uh, we're trying to offer that for free. And we're also trying to get more um, out into assisted living facilities, um, senior groups. So, um, and bringing animals to visit uh, for maybe people who can't have animals um, for whatever reason, but still enjoy them. <laughs> uh, so we're hoping to um, start doing a lot of that stuff very soon. Everything's sort of still in the works, but um, it's, I think it's going to be really great. And I brought um, the contact information for my coworker who's working on this. So if anyone um, 
is interested in that later, I can provide that. All right, that's it for adoption for the time being. Um, I'm next going to plug our, our fostering program, or just fostering in general, but um, of course we always need foster parents at the Humane Society. Um, fostering is really great because it, um, it, quite frankly, it does help us save lives because we do, you know, we do have an ample amount of space at our shelter, but occasionally even we run out or we have animals that just don't do well in a shelter um, and fostering helps them uh, find homes. So um, the great thing about fostering is that you, you're sort of in control of what you want to foster. So if you, um, we have fosters sometimes where an animal just needs um, foster a foster home for a week, two weeks. We have some that need a couple months. Uh, we have some where it's, you will just foster them until they get adopted, so the time is um, undetermined. Um, and again, with the different reasons, sometimes there's um, animals that are recovering from a, a surgery or an illness and just need sort of a more calm space to do that. Uh, sometimes there are animals that need a break from the shelter, it's just become stressful. Um, sometimes animals that need socialization. Maybe they've been living in a place where they didn't interact with many other um, people, so they're shy or hiding. Uh, and then if, if you have the energy, I don't, but we, <laughs> if you have the energy, we have some wonderful fosters who are specially trained to help take care of what we call our bottle babies, which are kittens and puppies who come in without a mother and aren't uh, old enough to be on their own and quite literally have to be fed with with bottles. So, um, and when I say the energy, I mean like you have to do this every few hours. So <laughs> that's why I don't have the energy, but it's, it's really great. And, um, and springtime is the time where we need those, those bottle baby fosters the most. So um, fostering is really great. If you're interested in it, um, the way our program works is that you just sign up for a foster orientation. During that program, we just talk about uh, the basics of what's expected of a foster. Um, after you do the orientation, we come do a home check, and which I think sounds intimidating, but we're really just trying to make sure that there's um, nothing, you know, obviously there's no signs of <laughs> animal neglect happening, but primarily we're actually trying to make sure that the, you know, house isn't too nice for <laughs> maybe some of the animals. Um, so, um, but, uh, that sounded bad, but I just mean like, <laughs> do you have a lot of fragile <laughs> glass things? Uh, maybe you don't want to foster this rambunctious dog. Um, after you do the home check, you basically are signed up to do, um, you get email notifications. So what we'll do is when we have an animal or animals that need foster, we send out um, this email. We'll include a picture. Uh, we'll include a little blurb about them. And then we'll say how long they need foster. So. Um, and when you get those, if you see it like, oh, I could foster that one, you just reply back and say, I can take that animal. Um, if none of them work for you, you just ignore the email and wait for the next one. So um, it's, it's a really great program if you want to help, you want to have some animals um, around, but you maybe don't quite have the commitment to have your own. Um, although I will warn you that there are many, many reports of foster failures at our shelter, which is our, our sounds mean, but is our term for people that adopt their, their foster animals. And I am one of them. <laughs> oh. Um, now, if, um, again, if fostering even is still maybe too much, um, we do, we always need volunteers, always, always. Um, we have we're a very fortunate facility. We have about 100 paid staff people, but we have about 1,000 volunteers. So they're doing a lot of work for us. Um, we have people, we have all kinds of um, activities you could do to volunteer. If you want to be active, we have dog walking um, shifts. We have people that just come and sit with our cats, um, pet them, make them feel calm. The really, really nice people who do our laundry, which is never ending and sometimes gross. Um, so uh, uh, there's also, we have, some people are greeters. So we have people who sort of stand in our front lobby and greet people as they come in and sort of tell them where things are. Uh, we have administrative tasks. Um, we also, uh, just a short plug, but we always need help in our humane ed program. So if you're a fan of, of kids, uh, we can always use some help with our, uh, with our programs. And uh, the highly sought after one, um, 
is our Love Train. If you are not familiar with Love Train, it is a special program that we do where we go down to, um, we have a partner facility in Tennessee, um, and they just have a huge pet overpopulation program down there. And unfortunately, they have puppies that just end up being euthanized because they don't have homes or space for them. And we have people up here who want puppies. So we go down twice a month. Um, it, it's not actually a train, it's a van, but love van just doesn't sound as good. So, uh, so the love train goes down, um, and then what we do is they usually come in Wednesday evenings, and we have volunteers um, who sign up to offload the puppies, basically. So you carry a puppy in, get them their medical check, and then get them into their, their kennel for the evening. It's a highly sought after shift, um, which I can understand because they're very cute, um, but I will say it's late for me. It's uh, oftentimes like nine o'clock at night, so. <laughs> um, but, uh, but volunteering is, um, is uh, again, really needed and really pretty vital to, uh, to the work that we are able to do. Um, and that, I think, sorry, I knew I was going to ramble and go quickly, but um, I do love answering questions. So um, like I said, I've worked at the shelter for about 10 years. Um, the past six in humane education, but I've worked in adoptions, and I also did briefly work on our rescue team. So if anyone, um, I can I can answer a lot of questions. <laughs> All right, yes? Um, when you foster, does oh, oh, we have a microphone. Oh. Yeah. Hi, when you go into the fostering program, does uh, Huron Valley uh, Humane Society, do they support the fostering with food supplies and vetting but, taking care of the animals? That's a great question. Yes, we cover all of that. So really, all we expect of you is your home and your time. Um, but we'll provide everything else. I understand that you have opportunities for teens to volunteer. And there are so few in the community. Would you please tell us about dog walking and the like, which our teen grandchildren and others may get involved in? Thank you. Absolutely, what you're referring to is our junior volunteer program. It's one of my favorite things. Um, these are for youth between 12 and 17. And um, what we do with them is we, we do, it's volunteering, but we also treat it a bit like an educational opportunity. So um, they sign up, we do um, a six session education thing where we talk about um, what the Humane Society is, uh, animal welfare in general. And of course, we teach them how to visit with the animals. Um, I will say for liability reasons, they're not allowed to walk the dogs, but they are allowed to sit in with the cats and dogs and, and visit with them. Um, and we offer it year round. So it's a really great program. Um, and we offer that both at our main Humane Society and at Tiny Lions, we have junior volunteer opportunities. So I know for some um, who maybe do live more Western Washtenaw, um, Tiny Lions is sometimes a little bit easier to, to get to. Um, but yeah, it's a really great program and uh, I do help with that, so I'm happy to, I guess, give any more information, but basically you have to sign up online. Um, and yeah, they can volunteer. So we have some volunteers who legitimately um, started junior volunteering at 12 and stayed all the way till they turned 18 and transitioned into an adult volunteer. So it's a great program. Okay. Do, do you have, we have a, a community service team that goes out and does projects in the community. They're one-time things, so it's not we're not available every month to do. We'd like to find different things to do to support the community. We've got a team of I don't know 30, 40 people, and uh, but we could we could do four or five people. Are there one-time projects that you could use help with with your volunteer uh, in program? Absolutely. Um, we actually have a program called Day of Service, um, where we just have groups come in um, for, it's usually a few hours, and um, do whatever project we have going at that time. So yes, absolutely. Um, and I should have brought I should have brought cards for everyone at my organization, but like I said, there's about 100 people who work there, so it would have been a little tight. But um, I can get you the contact information for the person who sets those up. Yeah, that would be great if you could do that. And a second question, mm -hmm. uh, your, uh, your foster care one, one of the problems with having a pet is particularly if you're older and you want to travel, is what, what do I do with this dog? or this cat went and do, what is the foster care program available for that yes actually that's a great question so um this is a thing with we're grateful for 
really any amount of time that you can foster an animal. So we have this happen sometimes where people are fostering an animal and then they're going on vacation for a few weeks. Um, you just bring the, the foster animal back to us. Um, they will either stay in the shelter or we'll find a temporary different foster family um, for the time being. So yeah, don't, um, I would say don't let travel plans restrict you from doing fostering because we, we can work with that. I have a question from the internet. Okay. <laughs> Which pet is easiest to leave behind when you leave home for a month or more? Uh, um, none. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah. Okay, and the other thing was options with foster care, but you did talk oh, about that. Great, yes. Um, so, t actually, a couple things. Um, so, when these animals go back and forth and back and forth, does it cause them any psychological problems? Um, I think depending on the animals, sometimes it can. It, you know, moving is stressful, especially sometimes cats tend to be more affected by the stress of changing locations more. Um, and, you know, it's not perfect, but I guess for us, the um, it's, still a, it's still a better option than them suffering in the shelter. And then the other question is, um, could you speak a little bit about donations of things like towels oh. and food? Yeah, I suppose I should have done that. Um, yes, so we need a lot of donations. Obviously, monetary ones are always helpful, but yeah, we, I can pretty much guarantee we always need towels, we always need blankets. Those are a pretty much a constant. Um, if you, we do also have Amazon wish lists um, for, we have just a main one for our shelter, and then we actually have different wish lists for, um, for various departments for specific needs. So um, like right now, we there's something called kitten replacement milk, uh, which uh, is for our little bottle babies. We need uh, that donated. Um, so all of that is on our website, but uh, like I said, towels and blankets always. Um, peanut butter is always helpful for getting dogs to take their medicine. Um, things like that are, are always necessary. Do, uh... Do you provide services to other counties and says here in Valley? I, I happen to live in Livingston County. Yeah, unfortunately, not really. It, we want to help people the most we can. Um, it, it's really just a matter of funding to a certain extent of how far we can go. Um, that said, I, the person in charge of this, um, this bird grant. Sorry, I don't know. Um, the person in charge of the bird grant is really interested in helping um, as much in the big of a range as we can. So I would say if um, if you're just in the next county over, sort of, I would give us a call if we can be of assistance. But generally, we're restricted to Washtenaw County. Hi there. Hi. I'm looking for tips or advice on how to find a new uh, partner for my dog. We recently lost the other one, and he is um, devastated. No, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, that's sometimes even the harder part is not even our loss, but our, our other animals' loss. Um, I have. I will say for for us for our adoption services. Um, if you have a dog at home and you are interested in a dog at our shelter, you can bring your dog in and we'll do an interaction. So we'll do a meet and greet and see it. Um, you know, it's obviously, it's a one-time thing, so it's not necessarily going to show long-term how things will be, but it, it at least gives you an idea. Um, you can also, um, I'm trying to think if I know of any um, resources um, in the area, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm struggling to think. I, oh, I forgot to mention too, in addition to just the adoptions we do at our shelter, um, we do also have now a private adoption page. So these are animals that people are trying to rehome, um, but they, they don't want them to live in the shelter before getting a new home. So they, um, so we're sort of helping to facilitate, but we're, we haven't done any medical or behavior checks basically on these animals. Um, but I know a lot of people have found some good companions on there. So I'm sorry, I can't off the top of my head think of any other resource for I'm specifically. To, I'm sorry for dropping that on you. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I wish I had a better option <laughs> to give you.
Uh, you mentioned the Amazon ability to, I got a message from Amazon saying they were discontinuing a lot of those things. And I wasn't sure if the Humane Society was dropped off their mm. list of preferred places to adopt. Uh. But I also found out that Kroger is establishing now that you can, with all of your purchases at Kroger's, um, set up a donation through them. Yes. So that was brand new. I just found out about that and did that. And so. Yes. So that's a little bit confusing, that Amazon thing, because what it was is Amazon had a that Amazon Smile. And what Amazon Smile was, was you could, um, yes, basically, they would give, I think it was like 10% or something of the purchase to the organization of your choice, of which we were an option. Um, so they, they discontinued that, unfortunately. Um, but uh, our wish list are still, it's basically just a list, a conglomeration of links of things that we need that's available on Amazon, um, and you can just click on them and then it will send directly to us so you don't have to worry. And it's it's separate from Amazon Smile. Um, but yes, the Kroger, um, they have done those those rewards for a bit. So yeah, if you're a person with a Kroger card, um, basically you can sign up, uh, like attach your Kroger card to a certain nonprofit organization. And yes, we, we do participate in that. So if you're a Kroger shopper here, <laughs> um, that would be great. I have a couple of things. One is, for some who may not know about it, would you describe what Tiny Lions ah. is? It's a great program. And the other is, whether you encourage people to get involved once they adopt a pet with Therapaws of Michigan or equivalent because they organize pet visits in hospitals and um, homes, uh, senior homes and the equivalent and bring a lot of joy to people besides for going to libraries around student exam time <laughs> and letting the students pet their animals and calm down and feel joy. Yeah, and great. provide joy. Great question. Thank um, you. So as for Tiny Lions, uh, I apologize for not mentioning that earlier. Tiny Lions is, it's over on the west side of Ann Arbor, um, off of Jackson near Zeed. And it's, um, we call it the Tiny Lions Lounge and Adoption Center. It's otherwise known as a cat cafe. Um, but it is connected to the Humane Society. So basically, we have free roaming cats over there. Um, we sort of stopped referring to it as a cafe because we don't actually serve <laughs> drinks or anything there. Um, there used to be a Big B next door and that worked out very nicely but um, but they are not there anymore. Although if you want to get a facial and then visit kittens, uh, that, that is now available. <laughs> um, so um, yes, it's just this little facility and the cats are free roaming but they're also up for adoption. So um, people go, some people go there just because they've want to find a social cat that they can adopt, and other people go there just to get some cat time. Um, so I have a lot of people who go there because like, they love cats, but a family member has allergies, or again, maybe they can't have cats of their own for whatever reason. You, um, how it works is you pay, there's just an hourly fee, and that just goes towards our care of the animals. Um, and you go visit, and then, and then you go home. So it's, it's a really cool place, and I, I will say for anyone who's interested, it's a fun place all the time, but we are about to head into what we call kitten season, uh, which means that uh, a lot of cats are having babies, and it's going to be, you know, it's fun to go over there when there's like 15 kittens running around, <laughs> so it's a good time. Um, as for the, the therapy dogs, or therapaws, um, I, I am of course familiar with their work and I think it's fantastic. We don't have any formal relationship with them. Um, one of the, I suppose, disadvantages of a, a shelter situation is that we we don't have the resources ourselves to you know do any sort of therapy dog training so um, our dogs that come in some of them might be great temperament for it but sometimes not um, but it's certainly especially maybe people who are adopting puppies it might be great for us to start suggesting that they look into that because it is it's an incredibly valuable service. I, I wish we had therapy dogs to take places, but, um, and sometimes we do. We have those very calm, sweet ones that sometimes we have ones that just want to run all over. <laughs> all right. I have looked into therapies for our dog, and I think they do have an age. Oh, okay. That, you know, they just don't take them. 
handful of puppies right uh, because they don't know what you know whether they're going to pee on the person right. and that actually makes sense. Them, uh, that makes sense for other reasons because um dogs can't usually get their rabies vaccine until they're four months old either so usually that's a requirement good call <laughs> Um, as a former foster, I just want to give that a plug. I, I have a foster failure myself. After my six, six cats, I returned in tears. The seventh one never made it back. So um, I would explore that if, if you're interested. And I've done dogs as well. So um, I have a couple friends who have um, had some more kind of creative solutions on how to share pets with other people. Some of you may have friends who own a dog or a cat who want to travel. My friends have been kind of their step parents for dogs that come. I have friends who have a step dog that comes for a couple months out of the year when their owners are traveling, which has been a fantastic relationship for both of them. And also a friend who is retired living in a condo association who made friends on neighborhood walks with a a working single woman, a school nurse who had a dog at home. And so my friend visits almost daily and walks the dog and the dog spends time at her home. And she has no, I mean, neither of these people have any cost or long-term <laughs> responsibilities. So there are ways to spend time with animals. And I think if you're creative, and many of you I'm sure have stories like this, um, it's pretty easy to think out of the box if that's what you want to do. Absolutely, and as an organization, we don't necessarily have any specific statement on pet sharing, but I, I do think, you know, if everyone's on board, I think it can be a great opportunity, absolutely. I'm gonna tell a story just because your foster failure story made me think of it. So I grew up, um, I apologize for if no one's interested, but I grew up a dog person. I. Um, a, loved dogs all my life. I did, was not, I was definitively not a cat person um, and I was fostering um, for the Humane Society before I worked there. I was fostering dogs and every time I brought them back I was just, you know, bawling and I was like, I can't do this. So I was like, I still want to help. I'm going to foster a cat and I won't want to keep a cat and that is my foster failure because um, <laughs> I had fostered him and then they were like, he had a medical thing going on and they are like, he's ready to come back and I was just like, oh no. <laughs> oh no no and I am I am now very much a cat person so it happens <laughs> um, I, I have a um, black cat that started visiting my um, yard last fall and I I can't even open a window without it running away and um, do you and I have a black indoor cat that I adopted so I don't want to break so how do I take care I've been feeding this black mm. cat it's, it's a gorgeous cat, but I don't want it to get heartworm and everything else yeah. or rabies. And do you have a track neuter? I wouldn't even know how to catch it. Yeah. It's so vigilant. Yeah. The cats are really tricky. Um, neighborhood cats like that because, you know, just on that, and you maybe can give me more information later, but it's hard to know, is that just someone in the neighborhood's cat that goes in and out? Is, is it a true feral? Uh, I don't know. Um, but we do have a trap neuter return program, um, and uh, we would coordinate all of the, the trapping and um, getting them in. Um, if you're in Washtenaw County, um, I can get you the information for the individual in charge of that. But yeah, the trap neuter return, um, what we do is um, again, we trap them, we bring them in, we uh, spay or neuter them, and then we do give them um, appropriate vaccines, and then we return them to the, the area where they were found. Um, the idea being that Typically, and again, I don't know the case with this specific cat, but typically these are cats that don't want to live in homes with people, so we don't want to, you know, put them up for adoption. Um, so we uh, release them back where they can live their life, but they're not creating more and more and more neighborhood cats. Um, but yes, I, I would happily give you the um, director of the TNR program's number, but yes, yeah, uh, and we'll, like I said, we'll do all of it for you. <laughs> you just have to be willing to let us bring him back. <laughs> Um, Ed, you might have said this, but at any moment in time, today maybe, um, how many dogs are there and are there certain kinds of dogs that land with you? Like, you know, uh, pit bull mixes, um, I don't know, or 
whatever, yeah. uh, ages, um, color, um, whatever, um, you know, that may just not be something one anyone wants. And yep. kind of the same with cats. I heard black cats aren't as adaptable. But anyway, um, I'm interested in some of those. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, I don't think I did mention it, but um, so yes, we, we do have at, at any given day, we have a lot of pit bull mixes at our facility. It's very common for us, and I don't think just for us. I think it's just sort of the thing across. <laughs> um, I don't know about across the whole country, but certainly this region. Um, and I should have looked up. I actually don't know how many dogs we have in our care at the moment. Um, if I had to guess, I would say we probably have at least 50 uh, between foster homes and in the shelter. Um, but yeah, we, we get pit bulls, and I do say pit bull mixes because a lot of the time we don't know they're, they're coming in as strays, so we're, we're, we have to go, we can't afford to do DNA tests on all the dogs, so we're, we're going purely based on what they look like, so whether it's accurate or not, I don't know, but um, we do get pit bulls. Um, I'm personally quite partial to pit bulls, um, and I think they get a little bit of a bad rap, but they are often high energy dogs or dogs that maybe have a prey drive, so they're not good with cats. Um, so sometimes, yes, they do, for a variety of reasons, they take longer to get adopted. We do get other breeds of dogs, but they tend to go pretty quickly, especially small breeds. Some small breed dogs get adopted very quickly. Um, puppies get adopted quickly. Um, if we're ever fortunate enough to get like any sort of poodle mix in, they're out the door in a flash. So um, they do stay a little longer. Cats, um, Cats, I would say, I do think the black cat thing was legitimately a thing. Like they, I only have my own personal experience to talk about, but having worked at the shelter the past 10 years, I do feel like black cats, when I first started, tended to stay a little bit longer. I haven't noticed that being the case as much recently. So maybe the tide is turning for black cats. Like she mentioned in the introduction, I'm, I'm very partial to them myself. They just look like little panthers. But um, I would say older animals, tend to stay longer because again people are concerned about you know what sort of medical expenses are we going to run into or am I going to get attached to this animal and they're going to die right so um, you know understandable but yeah older animals any animals that have more like again medical concerns or energy concerns. <laughs> so yeah. I have a just um, do you notch the ears of the cats that you neuter and, and let go so she would know if it was already a catching? Yes, I'm sorry, that's a very important part of TNR I did not mention. So yes, when we, um, when we when an animal goes through the trap neuter return program, we it's called an ear tip. So it, it always sounds sort of um, barbaric, but we, we just cut up cut off the very tip of one ear, um, and that is just to indicate that they have already gone through this program so they don't need to be trapped again. Um, because again, unfortunately, these are not cats that are typically able to be handled, so we can't just go up and sort of check. So it's a visual indicator. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you chip the animals? Yes, we do also microchip. Um, uh, I apologize. I don't know if we microchip the cats that go through TNR, but any animal that's been adopted from us has been spayed or neutered, had their vaccines, and been microchipped. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this was so informative. Thank you very much. Thank you.